Uh, Melly is uh, uh, dramatized to me the issues of global warming when uh, one day a couple years ago, several years ago, how many years ago? Four, five years ago, uh, right after Al Gore's movie came out, uh, she brought it back to me from uh, Albany where she was studying at medical school and told me that her roommate, who was the leader of the environmental movement at Albany Medical School, had told her that this movie, this movie was a transforming event, that uh, everyone just had to see it, and it was an overwhelmingly persuasive and cogent. And so Melly came to me and said, Dad, we've got to watch this movie. And I, I was determined not to watch the movie, <laughs> but uh, it was Melly, and I usually do what she says. And so we went in and sat down and watched the movie. Melly, I believe, had her laptop on, on her lap as, as the movie proceeded. And within minutes, she was researching every point that uh, emerged. Uh, she's a chemist, and so she had a, a, a professional understanding as well as her medical experience. And by the end of the film, she had uh, launched into a two weeks, three weeks, I don't know how long it took her, but in no time flat she'd written Diagnosing Al Gore, and she really did hit virtually every uh, point in that film, every mendacious and, and uh, extreme and absurd assertion in that movie she had uh, tagged within uh, an amazingly short period of time. And then she gave a speech uh, to you guys in San Diego, which some of you appeared, uh, uh, heard. Uh, now she's uh, interested in foreign aid. She's spent time in Kenya and Thailand and Burma and various third world countries. And, and she uh, has honed in on the damage that foreign aid inflicts. Uh, a damage that I identified uh, quite quickly in uh, exploring the Israel issue, the Israel-Palestine issue in uh, the Israel test. It, a key to understanding the Middle East and this problem is that the PLO, the uh, Palestinian Authority is the world's leading recipient of foreign aid, most years, almost every year. And just last week, President Obama responded to various complaints from Mahmoud Abbas by uh, declaring the U.S. would send them an additional $400 million of foreign aid. And of course, this, what this does is enhanced the importance of politics, which is essentially a zero-sum competition, and eclipse the importance of entrepreneurship and creativity, which uh, is, partakes of uh, infinite potential gains. In any case, uh, I believe that foreign aid is absolutely pivotal to all sorts of problems around the world. It's much more destructive than most people imagine. And Melly can uh, dramatize some of this damage today. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you so much um, for inviting us here, especially um, thank you to all the Robinsons for having us. Uh, so the um, topic of this whole conference um, is truth-based change, and I think that this is um, really a very timely idea to bring to aid, um, which is really an, an industry that has been moving forward without a lot of evidence um, or sort of self-reflection -ref for um, about 60 years. Um, uh, this picture is really just for atmosphere, but it's, um, these are some children um, uh, from a 
a village called Lubahur in Burma. Um, and I think it's really children like this that make this question so crucial um, of what, what is really effective in um, bringing growth and opportunity to the de developing world and, and what really are the forces that um, support corruption and sort of maintain the current disastrous um, status quo. Um, so I've always been taught to have objectives. So, um, so my main objectives um, to d discuss what foreign assistance can and cannot do in the developing world and then d discuss other options for development. Um, so I'm, I would argue that foreign aid or um, foreign assistance in various ways can um, intervene in disasters, um, can provide valuable services that save lives and alleviate suffering. Um, however, I believe it really cannot um, end poverty as it often is touted um, to be on the road to doing and um, does not bring wealth to countries, does not cause development. Um, and I think some of, some of the main stumbling blocks um, are often the scale at which it's carried out at and the um, lack of individualized attention to the details of the recipient countries and the, and the lo local conditions that are being addressed. Um, uh, so some of um, my ideas have come from a book by William Easterly called uh, White Man's Burden, and he um, puts forth the idea that the world is full of um, two types of people, planners and searchers, and planners sort of start with a, a big, beautiful idea and uh, then try to uh, sort of uh, fit their method of a solution into that beautiful idea. And for global um, development, the b big, beautiful idea is the end of poverty. And um, Jeffrey Sachs, who wrote a book by that title, is one of the preeminent planners. Um, and he kind of works through the book sort of putting a price tag on development in various countries. For example, Ghana would cost $2 billion a year. And um, he goes kind of uh, country by country and, and picks out things, um, things that we could buy there to make them developed. Um, uh, in some ways, I think this sort of mirrors the hysteria around global warming, where we have this beautiful idea of having a healthy, clean environment for our children, and we're um, and environmentalists are kind of proceeding to figure out what the cost of that would be if we pursue it uh, via um, controlling CO2 emissions without really stopping to think, you know, will this method actually reach the goals that we're trying to get to? Um, in the same way, these huge infusions of cash into third world governments um, are continuing, uh, regardless of a lot of evidence that shows this is not actually leading us towards this dream of the eradication of poverty. Um, the other group of people are searchers, and these are people who look at um, local, local solutions, um, local situations, try to uh, draw on the resources that are inherent to um, uh, different communities. Um, and. Uh, Bill Easterly has a great quote about this, um, and he starts by saying that uh, the planners ask how much will it cost to achieve um, the end of poverty through foreign aid, but he says searchers ask the question the right way around. What, what can foreign aid do for poor people? Uh, setting a prefixed and grandiose goal is irrational because there is no reason to assume that the goal is attainable at a reasonable cost with the available means. It doesn't make any sense to have the goal that your cow will win the Kentucky Derby. No amount of expert training will create a Derby winning race cow. It makes much more sense to ask what useful things can a cow do? A cow can nicely feed a family with a steady supply of milk, butter, cheese, and unfortunately for the cow, beef. Um, of course, you could win the Kentucky Derby if you had a championship caliber horse. But decades of experience show that aid agencies are cows and not race racehorses. Um, uh, unfortunately, there are some searchers who become planners, and sometimes this happens by virtue of becoming involved in aid. And um, Bill Gates, who was a preeminent searcher of um, the last several decades now, apparently has just announced that 
um, in order to staunch the horrible, devastating effects of um, global warming on uh, developing nations, uh, the U.S. should invest, I think, an extra $16 billion a year in clean e energy research. Um, so he's unfortunately made the turn from being a searcher and an innovator to being a planner. Um, but there are many um, great searchers out there. Just a f couple examples of people who've really looked at the resources that are in uh, developing nations and how to um, mine those resources are um, uh, Mohamed Yunus of the Grameen Bank and um, Hernando de Soto, uh, who's a Peruvian economist, who both have kind of looked at how to capitalize on um, uh, social capital and um, local innovation. Um, these are some really fast cows, um, but still would not win the Kentucky Derby. Um, uh, some more examples of planning and searching that I've seen. Um, uh, I spent a short time working in Honduras, and these are some men from a uh, remote village um, called, called Los Potreros, um, who are, right now they are, in this picture, taking um, panels of glass down to a elementary school that is a good eight to ten miles by very rugged roads, um, or trails really, um, from the nearest uh, electrical pole. And they're bringing the panes of glass so that they can install an air-conditioned computer lab because the Honduran government with USAID money has decided to grant them a air-conditioned computer lab. And um, apparently no one had visited the site to realize that this was not gonna be a possibility. Um, uh, but uh, these are actually uh, the same group of men um, looking over a water project that they actually executed themselves with um, the guidance of um, the man in white in the white t-shirt um, who is a, play, a, a searcher and he has really been working with the community um, helping them um, essentially do their own development work um, he uh, gives them some of the resources, though he requires that they raise the money for a lot of it and um, do most of the work and actually develop most of the plans um, for the water projects. But he comes in as a consultant and kind of um, teaches them basic engineering so that they can execute this. And this uh, water project has been quite successful. Um, so. so why did we think development aid um, would work in the first place? Um, and I think a lot of this stems from uh, sort of the immediate post-World War II era when um, Europe was really in shambles and the Marshall Plan was rolled out, um, which sent huge chunks of aid to Great Britain, France, Italy, Germany, Norway, Austria, Greece, and the Netherlands, and by most accounts was very successful. I mean, Europe is doing pretty well today. Um, and I think this was sort of looked at as a model for aid, but if you look at it carefully, it's really very far from the situation that we see now um, with aid to developing countries. Uh, to start with, it was a very finite time span instead of these kind of unending flows of, of cash that we have now. Um, and they were really rebuilding a system that was pretty functional before the war, not starting from scratch and um, developing, uh, developing financial systems, developing markets. Um, some other reasons why one might sort of logically think that um, foreign aid would be successful. Um, we all know people who've been able to get an education they wouldn't have had access to without, um, without loans and um, financial aid. Um, also, we know, you know businesses that wouldn't have succeeded without, um, uh, without loans. At, and these are all types of aid that um, are very individualized and really encourage incentive, um, and again, are for finite periods of time. Um, but we also have the less inspiring um, models of welfare and um, disability, and unfortunately, these are more the kind of model of aid that we see now that encourage um, dependence and are more generalized, are less individualized, um, and are kind of ongoing indefinitely. Um, and um, so there's many, uh, pitfalls to large-scale aid. Um, a lot of it is uh, channeled directly through governments, um, many of whom are corrupt, um, and this uh, increases incentives to hold power. Um, in some ways, 
it's almost like in uh, the kind of mixed blessing of of natural resources of diamonds and gold and um, oil um, in that it it's localized sudden large amounts of money um, that are only in the hands of a few people. Um, and this often actually increases instability instead of decreases it, increases tribalism instead of decreasing it. Um, it rewards corruption, um, and actually studies show that um, countries that receive more aid um, end up with larger governments to sort of um, reinforce this point. And, and especially, again, in areas where there are sort of tribal um, uh, cultures, the, the more power that you have in the government, the more likely you are to have um, all of the, um, the president's tribe suddenly getting special concessions during their um, term in presidency, and then you get um, the sort of ethnic warfare we had in Kenya a couple years ago when there was a shift of the power. Um, other problems um, include poor accountability, and part of that is um, that a lot of aid organ organizations are really judged more on how much money they're dispersing rather than the results that they're um, causing. And, um, and this causes just some very um, uh, backwards incentives um, that uh, there's really no incentive for follow-up and um, nobody's really looking at these projects to see if they're increasing wealth and increasing um, opportunity for the, the host countries. Um, and then finally, unfortunately, they even undermine local economies. And as my father was saying, they you know, tend to discourage um, innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and in some cases, you know, the most stark examples are when our subsidized farming industry dumps large amounts of low-cost grain on the third world, thereby undercutting um, their um, uh, farmers. Uh, and one example from a country that I particularly care about from Burma, um, just with even disaster relief can sometimes be uh, siphoned off for, um, for corruption. And in, in the case of, this, of Cyclone Nargis, if you remember, uh, for weeks the Burmese government didn't even allow any aid to come in um, unless it was channeled directly through, um, through them. And as a result, almost nothing reached um, the villages that were affected for several weeks. And then down here is a publicized picture of the uh, general handing out little bags of rice. Um, but uh, fortunately, there are many searchers out there. Um, this is one example, uh, Dr. Cynthia Mong, um, who started a, um, a clinic on the Thai Burmese border after becoming a refugee herself. And she arrived there and she saw there was a need and she saw also that there was a large number of people who didn't have any work to do and she put them to work um, taking care of their own sick essentially. And has, um, this clinic has been going on now for over 20 years, has served um, thousands and thousands of um, uh, Burmese refugees and also people from inside Burma who don't have access to decent medical care there will come all the way across the border to um, access this care. And in addition, it has trained um, thousands of uh, healthcare workers to work along this um, area. Um, this is another searcher, um, Dambisa Moyo, who is a, a Zambian economist who is trained in the U.S. And she um, just came out with this book, Dead Aid, that really um, goes through the pitfalls of aid and and why it's causing so much damage um, the way it's currently been used. And um, she suggests other options um, for financing development, um, including more um, standard uh, bonds and credit that are not these uh, subsidized loans that have very little um, accountability to them, but, you know, before these developing countries to really pursue financing in a more responsible manner. Um, and trade, um, the biggest pitfall with trade is, um, unfortunately, both America and Europe um, subsidize so much um, our farming that it is hard for um, 
the developing countries to get a comparative advantage, but um, there's still a lot of op opportunities for, for trade within um, developing countries, and China actually um, has been increasingly trading with African nations, partially because they desperately want uh, uh, Africa's oil, um, but as a result, they've been uh, building large um, highways and, and really making an impact on the local conditions. Um, another source of income in developing countries is remittan remittances. Um, people in developed countries sending money back home. And again, that's a source of money that's much less likely to be taken uh, for granted because if your cousin is working, you know, 60 hours a week in a hotel in um, the UK, you're much less likely to uh, take that money for granted than if it's a handout from a, a foreign government. Um, and then the other is, again, uh, foreign directed investment. And again, she uh, lists China as a ma major source of that right now in Africa um, in a sort of changing, changing situation in the post-colonial era. Um, another uh, kind of fun uh, example is Kiva, which is a, uh, another microfinance uh, organization similar to the Grameen Bank, um, but this directly links um, people in the first world with entrepreneurs in developing countries, and you can look it up online, and read different people's profiles and their business ideas and their business experience, and um, individuals in the first world can pledge, you know, can offer loans of, um, you know, whatever amount uh, you're interested in, and it goes directly to these entrepreneurs and um, they have, apparently have something like a 97% um, repayment rate. Um, and then finally, this is a friend of mine, Wen A. Lin, who I um, taught when he was quite young. He, like those children on the first slide, um, was born in a small village in Burma and grew up in a refugee camp. Um, and uh, because of uh, a small aid organization's work directly um, with education with these children, uh, he um, it spoke good English and had a good uh, basic math and science background by the time he was resettled by the UN to America. And now he's finished high school here um, and is planning to go to college and is very dedicated to heading back to his homeland to, um, to work there. And um, even though aid on a large scale may be um, a cow without a hope of winning the Kentucky Derby. I think there's kids out there like Wayne Allen who may be racehorses and um, may be really able to make a difference um, in their home countries. Um, and and it also a good example not to um, that not to throw out all assistance um, to developing countries, but that the real the real danger lies in the large scale um, government to government aid. But that there's some really valuable things that can be done on an individual basis, um, uh, especially in sort of education and um, health. I would say. So that's it. Thank you. I want to ask Melly a, que a question. Um, Burma has uh, long been known as one of the most isolated countries in the world. And I've just been reading a book by Matt Ridley called The Rational Optimist, which is a terrific book where Matt, the dean of science writers in Britain, has uh, turned violently against global warming and uh, as a fraud and has written a great book of uh, showing how virtually all the policies of the Greens uh, destroy the environment and uh, hurt the poor. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, but his thesis is the only way to uh, develop these countries is trade. It's more, it's uh, going back to Adam Smith, uh, expanding specialization in the division of labor through expanding trade, and it's the exchange, the process of exchange, what Hayek called catalactics that um, makes possible development in these countries. And local programs that try to uh, localize their economies almost are poverty 
creation programs, because poverty, as Matt describes it, is, is chiefly uh, self-sufficiency. That's what poverty is. Uh, subsistence is poverty. Self-sufficiency is poverty. If we drive to create energy independence, we will probably impoverish ourselves in the process. Uh, how does that fit with your uh, views and your experience in Burma and Thailand? Thailand is deeply engaged in the world economy. Burma is isolated from it. Yes, I think I, I agree. Um, I think in Burma, it has this you know, repress, repressive military dictatorship that's basically cut itself off from all other countries except North Korea. It has some, um, some dealings with North Korea. But um, uh, I think that the critical thing with trade is that it um, can really open up the possibility of developing a middle class and a, a, a group of, of people who are aware of, of changes in the world, who are aware of technology developments, um, and it also decentralizes power um, as there's wealth springing up from other sources. Um, uh, it takes away some of the incentive to grab and hold um, the central political powers. Um, I think that uh, one pitfall, though, can be to, uh, I think a lot of uh, the World Bank and IMF um, uh, strategies in the past have been to sort of uh, plant a uh, uh, Western free market economy on a lot of um, countries where I think in a lot of cases it has to develop more from the ground up and that, that again, with more individualized, um, more nuanced approach looking at, you know, what sort of cultural things are already there that, that um, will support, what, and, and especially things like um, trust and cultural collateral, I mean, uh, sort of um, social collateral that are so critical to having a, a real market economy. Um, and so I think that's the, the, one, the one danger to um, saying that um, applying the Adam Smith principle across the board. Thank you, Melly. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much for uh, applying Adam Smith's principles across the board. <laughs> but, uh, and I think local cultures can thrive better in uh, the context of the global economy than they can if they're cut off from it. So, I agree, but I think their entrance has to be individualized for each country. So, so I think that <laughs> you can't, um, yes, that, that sometimes our, our methods through the World Bank have not been successful in actually causing this change. So again, we need to find the local, um, the local forces that are going to bring about the change. Adam Smith likes that. Uh, <laughs> you, Oh, just a general comment that um, I agree a little bit about the trade, but if you mean trade with internationally, yes, but I think the, the, the first criteria, that's just a corollary of freedom because any trade whatsoever, any voluntary transaction, both sides benefit or it wouldn't be voluntarily done. They each get something they prefer. Their, their real wealth in real terms is increased, so you've created wealth. Any transaction that's voluntary creates wealth. So if you even just freed up the local economy, so that that would start creating wealth. Uh, and the more trading you do, the more wealth you're creating. So internationally, that ad increases wealth. And then it seems very simple. From there on, all you do is, you know, you need to create wealth in order to have savings so that you can build a capital structure and have a stable society where you do have freedom and uh, respect contracts and so on if you want to get it boosted by getting an influx of outside capital that feels comfortable with your situation. And then uh, that, because that's the solution to poverty is the capital, the real capital per capita is the indication of the level of wealth, pure and simple. So that's it.
Excellent point. You, you don't have any objection. No, no objection. We don't want to pound that guy down, do we, Melanie? They're going to keep the rest of their questions until the end. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, I think uh, the, the last point that was made really can be summed up in terms of information theory, which I've been exploring uh, deeply in recent uh, years, actually ever since I started writing about the telecommunications industry and discovered all Shannon's work on uh, how to define the capacity of a circuit, of, a, of a, a conduit. And uh, the key principle of information theory, I think, for in, in general terms, is surprisal. Uh, information is measured by the degree that it's unexpected. If I, it's, it's news. In other words, if I get up here and say nothing that you haven't heard before because you've attended all my other speeches at the uh, uh, Doctors for Disaster Preparedness, then um, I have transmitted no information. It's, it has zero surprisal. And a key point of information theory is it takes a low surprise, a low entropy carrier to bear high entropy information. So you need a carrier that has no surprises in order to bear a message that's full of information, has, has uh, surprises. And my view is that, uh, is that this formula is the best way to uh, formalize uh, the economics of entrepreneurship, that, uh, that uh, you need a low entropy carrier, that is a, a predictable governmental environment, a predictable legal environment, a predictable currency value, uh, uh, in order to bear the unexpected entrepreneurial contributions, the create creativity uh, always comes as a surprise to us. That's the fundamental property of creativity is that it's unexpected. It comes as a surprise. And, and the measure of surprisal in a capitalist economy is profit. And uh, I think profit is a direct analogy to entropy in uh, communications theory. And thus it allows, uh, it's the only way that an economic system can actually accommodate uh, a, a system of, of uh, an economic model can actually accommodate the heart of economic growth, which is entrepreneurial surprise, entrepreneurial creativity. As Peter Drucker explained, the best way to identify opportunities is through upside surprises and unexpected profits. And uh, that seems, and that is indeed the heart of economic growth. And currently we're in the midst of a global economic stagnation, a global economic crisis produced, I think, in part by this resistance to surprisal in um, many of the economic models that have prevailed, including the key investment model, which is called the efficient markets theory, the capital assets theory, which has governed most investment and governed uh, the financial community in Wall Street, led them to quantify risk as, uh, as a mathematical function and thus uh, denied the essential, the essential surprises of entrepreneurial creativity. As a matter of fact, the efficient markets theory denies that investors actually can successfully do fundamental analysis and thus anticipate stock market successes. 
uh, and that thus uh, uh, they make, do all kinds of studies that show a dartboard model is, uh, can succeed as well as uh, uh, a venture investor. And uh, I believe that this has been fundamental to our economic uh, uh, crisis. They denied that it was possible for entrepreneurs really, to, or, or important for entrepreneurs to examine all the loans, the mortgages that were at the foundation of the, uh, these subprime instruments and the derivatives based on them. And, and because they denied that this entrepreneurial knowledge was important, uh, they believed that you could create castles of quantification on the basis of, uh, of essentially mathematical formulations of risk based on generalized past experience. And that turned out to be a catastrophic um, mistake. Uh, upside, uh, the true upside surprises are, are measured and, and are evidenced uh, by and the flaws in the efficient market theory and the idea of perfect competition, which uh, is the foundation of many of these analyses, are, um, are sh shown by the performance of venture capital. Uh, over 10 years, $1 of venture capital yields about $7 of business revenue, a, a annual uh, $7 revenue flow, and about $140 of uh, increased market capitalization. And this is the, shows what happens when entrepreneurs are infinite, intimately engaged uh, and the investment process, process is intimately involved in, uh, entre in entrepreneurial knowledge and creativity. And now, uh, knowledge is about the past. Entrepreneurship is about the future. And, and uh, so the more uh, uh, economic activity is based on top-down foreign aid, as Melly describes it. The more it's based on the past, the more it's based on obsolescent expertise, and the less it's based on uh, an orientation toward the future and uh, the generation of these surprises, upside surprises of uh, enterprise. Uh, and we've had these upside surprises even in dreadful economies like today. You know, the 1970s, which was an uh, analogous period, the 1970s were virtually as, as chaotic and as depressed as today. As a matter of fact, decidedly more uh, depressed by most measures. And uh, the 1970s uh, did not stop the emergence of Genentech, Microsoft, Intel, Oracle, Apple, Federal Express, many of the key companies which uh, drove the world economy in subsequent years found their origins in these desperate straits of the 1970s. And th this is in the United States. Another tremendous upside surprise in uh, times of utter catastrophe resembling today came in New Zealand in the early 1980s. And uh, New Zealand elected a labor government. It was uh, astonishing. And that labor government decided to zero out all their government programs. New Zealand had been one of the richest countries in the world, third richest. Uh, uh, coming out of the Second World War and uh, with the greatest longevity and within 30, 40 years had become a th virtually a third world country. It couldn't even feed itself. And so finally it reached a, a point of such desperation that it zeroed base budgeting of its entire government. And the greatest upside surprise came in agriculture. Uh, they eliminated their Department of Agriculture, reduced it from 20,000 people to four people. 
and four bureaucrats. And, and the result was the number, that when they started, they were uh, not feeding themselves. They were, uh, had a balance of trade deficit in agriculture. And within five years after that, the number of agricultural products had increased from about 10 to 17,000. And, uh, and uh, Wisconsin was complaining about the unfair competition from, from New Zealand in dairy products. You know, exotic forms of butter, new cheeses, all the creativity, efflorescence that happened in New Zealand is an amazing thing to see. A guy named Maurice McTeague has uh, presentations at Heritage that are just overwhelming. It's possible. Uh, when you cut government, it's all upside. You sh it's not cost. It doesn't cost money to cut back government. It releases private energies that dwarf the uh, public expenditures. And so that has been a, a great example. And uh, on the other hand, when you extend government, you transform industries that were generating tax revenues into consumers of tax revenues. And what's really demoralizing to me is looking at Silicon Valley, which has been the uh, creative force spearheading the entire global economy and uh, now is actually angling for subsidies. It wants to be a tax consumer rather than a tax producer. It wants green energy subsidies. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, this book by uh, Matt Ridley, which I recommend to all of you. It's a great summary of, of, of uh, all the learning and insights that have been developed by this group over the last uh, 20 years or so. And, and he's, he uh, uh, shows that uh, it's, uh, that it, the Industrial Revolution was not a mistake. And uh, it uh, is above all good for the poor. It's above all good for uh, the environment. And the more coal you use, the better. Not only the better off for Matt Ridley, who has a huge coal mine, and thus uh, uh, under his castle in uh, where it's Newcastle, uh, he he brings coal to Newcastle. But um, but uh, his uh, inspiring tale of the contributions of coal to uh, the, the environment and to the poor is very. Uh, uh, persuasive. He shows that unlike all alternative fuels, there has been no diminishing returns of, that afflict uh, coal mining so that uh, coal or fossil fuel production of all kinds. Uh, as in general, these uh, forms of fuel have experienced a learning curve and have actually declined in cost over the years. And they've been able to respond to any increase in need uh, without uh, uh, incurring uh, diminishing returns. And he shows that all the various uh, uh, alternative uh, forms of fuel just uh, rapidly uh, hit diminishing returns and uh, they're all terrestrially oriented. They consume the most valuable resource which is arable land and, and uh, 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 wa they waste uh, the most valuable resource and uh, they uh, uh, do nothing for the, and thus they actually are the chief threat uh, to the environment. So, um, the, um, so upside surprises come in many forms, and I believe that we're now uh, uh, confronting an upside surprise in uh, internet technology. And uh, th we have, uh, once again, a transformation of the internet is underway. And Every 10 years, um, you know, Moore's law shows that the computer power 
doubles every 18 months to two years. That's Moore's Law, which actually was uh, named and researched by Carver Mead, my guide at Caltech. I didn't actually go to Caltech. I went to Carver Mead's house. And, uh, and he educated me for several years. And it was, uh, it was a hugely edifying experience. But, uh, so, but Moore's Law uh, shows this constant doubling of computer power, which uh, has been uh, feeding the global information economy. But uh, the less known law is Gordon Bell's law. He was a leading uh, engineer at digital equipment, and then now at Microsoft. And Gordon Bell's law is every 10 years, this 10-year uh, effect of Moore's law produces a radical change in computer architecture. And uh, this radical change in computer architecture is underway uh, today. And, uh, and it's, uh, it uh, will uh, transform the internet. And, and uh, the, it's usually known as cloud computing. And it, uh, it, which, and the cloud computing essentially means the transfer to uh, remote and massive aggregations of computer and storage capability of uh, functions that would ordinarily uh, be performed locally. So, so you get uh, uh, the possibility of having a single uh, iPhone or BlackBerry or whatever capable of tapping supercomputer power at any time. And uh, this uh, is really represents a radical transformation of the way computation is performed that uh, has only just begun to happen. And accompanying it is this massive increase in video uh, as the dominant form of, of uh, bits and bytes on the internet. And by, uh, over the last, since, since the year 2000, uh, the United States has had a, real, a miracle of broadband deployment. People haven't, uh, uh, you wouldn't imagine it if you uh, spent much time in Washington where they're constantly complaining about uh, how the United States has allegedly fallen ever farther behind in uh, the Internet. But the fact is the U.S. led the world in deregulating uh, the Internet in the early 2000s. And as a result, there was a huge flood of new investment in internet technology and a vast increase in uh, the availability of bandwidth. Uh, there is some four, um, uh, there is uh, the increase in wireless bandwidth, which wasn't, uh, nobody in Washington was really focusing on when they talked about broadband in the early 1980s, the increase in wireless bandwidth was a factor of 542 up till last year. The increase in overall consumer bandwidth was 91, a factor of 91, 91 times. And uh, the uh, uh, wired broadband was increased 54-fold during this time. Total available bandwidth uh, in the United States. And this advance uh, far exceeded the advance of in Europe, where much more regulation was uh, imposed. So today, uh, while we see the government taking over banking and uh, automobile, the automobile industry, and, and uh, reaching out to take over the energy industry in a massive way, transforming all these industries from tax generators to tax consumers, uh, they now are moving to take over the internet. 
and uh, they have, uh, uh, I call it cap and trade for the internet. And the uh, name that they use is network neutrality, which is, uh, applies to every uh, uh, bit as if it's uh, affirmative action applicant. And all bits have to be treated, created, treated equally regardless whether they're video or voice or email or a big data dump or whatever it is, you can't charge more for difficult bits. And, and uh, in other words, the specter of discrimination on the internet is being lodged against uh, the suppliers of internet bandwidth who have achieved this huge gain over the last uh, decade and uh, the, the carriers, as they're called. And uh, uh, some of these Silicon Valley entre entrepreneurs are becoming enemies of the information economy. People like Google and, or who, are, who are, have the terrible fear that uh, Verizon or AT&T may actually succeed in out-competing with them for uh, the provision of advertising over the internet. They're very, and this fear of discrimination on the internet has uh, allowed the presentation of this network neutrality law that would in result in government intrusion all across the internet. You know, you have to prevent discrimination anywhere. And all, since none of the definitions are very clearly defined, they, they all uh, open, open sesame for litigation. And litigation, of course, is a high entropy, unexpected uh, bits, uh, unexpected activity uh, are making the conditions for enterprise on the net more inclement. And nothing, uh, what determines discrimination on the internet is the amount of investment in the internet. If, if uh, you have enough bandwidth to handle all the bits, uh, there's no interest in discriminating. So, um, but if you, uh, uh, have inadequate bandwidth, you have to discriminate regardless of what the law says. There's no choice. Uh, the internet is a best efforts operation and you have to throw away bits and discriminate regardless of, of the law. So the effect of network neutrality, the extent it creates a carnival of litigation undermining investment in uh, bandwidth will be to create conditions for the very discrimination that it cites as a pretext for the law. Isn't this typical of all government activity? But beyond this, it also endangers our security, I believe, because uh, the, you know, among the, the rules that among the dangers that are often cited is the danger of deep packet inspection. And this is the ability to, at uh, a rate of trillions of bits a second, to actually read each packet and identify viruses or, or security threats or, or advertising opportunities or whatever it is. Uh, and this is a tremendous technology, but it won't be developed and applied widely unless uh, there is a commercial market for it. And, and uh, this effort to suppress deep packet inspection as a, as a danger rather than a, a opportunity for the internet is endangers our security because uh, this is gonna be crucial to uh, uh, national security concerns. And the real motivation for suppressing deep packet inspection is really the hunger for deep pocket inspection of uh, 
the telecom companies that are and cable companies that are investing in in the internet. So it's a it's a a destructive a destructive force. Um, so uh, I think we we're going to have a zettabyte by uh, uh, 2015. A zettabyte is uh, 10 to the 20. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> An exabyte is 10 to the 18th, so a zettabyte's got to be 10 to the 21st, and that's uh, a thousand-fold more uh, traffic and bandwidth than we have today, and it will require a transformation of the Internet and lots of investment to make it possible. But it does produce the kind of interplay and exchange of information that, uh, uh, Ridley shows has been absolutely critical to uh, uh, the emergence of wealth around the world. So, uh, don't solve problems, pursue opportunities is my general theme. And uh, uh, you, you uh, solve problems and you end up being pulled back into the past. You feed your failures, you starve your strengths, and you prop up the past in the name of progress. And uh, this is really what the government does. And uh, by unleashing entrepreneurship, you pursue opportunities. The upside surprises of profit, which uh, actually can or revitalize an economy even in the dire conditions we have today. And uh, so that is uh, the lesson of, of um, information theory to uh, our current economic predicament. Now, I'm sometimes known to be a futurist. I've been accused of being a futurist on uh, many occasions. Before you introduce me, I just, can we go back to coal mining being good for the environment? All right. You, you don't think coal mining <laughs> is good for the environment? I, I mean, it, 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 coal mining takes up lots of, you're, you're saying that, that these other technologies are wasting land, but I mean, strip mining, well, cutting off a mountaintop in West Virginia, I mean. It, it, we hear about those mountaintops in West Virginia a lot. Um, but uh, the fact is, if you, if you actually scrutinize uh, the impact of coal mining compared to the impact of biofuels or windmills or all the medieval uh, information, I mean, energy sources that we're currently pursuing in the name of alternative energy, they actually are much more destructive to, for the environment than coal mining, which has the advantage of uh, actually providing a useful fuel. Now, if uh, coal mining can be, uh, uh, you know, we would like to see a transition from coal to nuclear, it uses even radically less uh, space per uh, power <laughs> yield than coal does. But the idea that, that, it, that the emissions of CO2 justify the suppression of coal mining and the impoverishment of poor Matt in Newcastle, <laughs> I think is uh, untrue. Um, but uh, this is Louisa, uh, who you've met before. And uh, uh, Louisa, I think, is a real futurist. I'm sure she will uh, deny it. But when she was a junior at Dartmouth, uh, she was studying physics, it, it, she uh, discovered the phenomenon of, phenomenon of entanglement, and which she will explain to you. It's roughly the uh, correlation. Well, she discovered that uh, the, uh, she didn't discover entanglement for the first time, but she, she did, but she discovered it in her life and in her knowledge of physics. And it seemed to me that, seemed to her that this was uh, a radical development. 
Uh, here was spooky action at a distance. Here were remote correlations that seemed weird. Here were uh, wave, quantum wave functions reaching out across the universe. I mean, it seemed to her to be a fundamental change, uh, even though it was at the same time a manifestation of quantum insights. And I believe for her as a junior at Dartmouth to identify this phenomenon. At the time, her favorite interpreter of uh, entanglement was a professor, it was a, a researcher at CERN named John Bell. And John Bell was almost an unknown physicist at the time that she began exploring his uh, career. And by the time her book came out, um, eight years later or something, uh, uh, John Bell was the most quoted physicist in the professional literature by 40%. And entanglement was a preoccupation of, of physics departments around the world and was even beginning to bubble up into entrepreneurial um, roles in such fields as quantum cryptography and quantum computing. So uh, this seems to be a great feat of futurism excelling any that I've accomplished. And uh, so, Louisa, take it away. So my, my dad is talking about um, information theory and, and how um, I, Gord, Gordon Bell's yeah. law is, is changing, um, is, is, is showing the, how, how computers are going to change and how the, the relationship of the computers to the internet is going to change. Um, but I also think further, my Bell, John Bell, um, his law, his, his theorem is, which, which deals with entanglement, that entanglement is on its way to changing computers and information theory. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It, when um, Turing first came up with the idea of the, the Turing machine, the, the initial idea of the computer, and this led directly to Claude Shannon, who Dad mentioned um, in 1948, coming up with information theory, and that, that, that studying, um, uh, st studying computers, which seems to someone like me that was never very interested in computers, seems like a very specific thing, and it leads to this, you know, information is one of the most general and important things in the world, and, and in fact, as, as we go in deeper into, into quantum physics, it becomes more, it seems that information is deeper and deeper in the, in the, quantum physics deals with what the world is made out of on the most fundamental level, and it seems just deeply intertwined with, with information to the point where sometimes you hear physicists talking as if reality and information are two sides of the same coin, and it, it, that, that gets, um, a little foggy sometimes, who knows what's really there, but the point being that it, to, you start studying, j just as when they were um, building train uh, steam engines and dealing with, with the technology of, of, of this, the steam engine, this had such, this, this fed this, uh, the study of thermodynamics and the understanding of energy, and so that in, we, we often think that um, you know, scientists are, are doing sort of pure studies and then those get applied by technologists, but, but there's much more of a synergy um, and an interrelation going on. And uh, there, there, there's a wonderful book while we're, while we're um, talking about books uh, by, this is called Einstein's Clocks, Poincaré's Maps. And it's by Peter Gallison, and it's about how Einstein, the, the quintessential ivory tower physicist, was, he, what was he doing in that patent office? He was studying synchronized clocks and all the patents. The big new thing was how do you synchronize clocks? And of course, relativity completely comes out of the synchronization of time. Can, can there be synchronicity? Um, so simultaneity between times, time, and of course there 
Einstein's insight was that no, there there can't. And um, and 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 there's just this wonderful book showing how one science doesn't doesn't drive technology or technology drives science, but they're each involved in this dialogue with each other. And and so so I. I recommend that book, but um, with it in the um, with the steam engines, we've got the steam engines and and thermodynamics working together, and we have this incredibly important idea of energy, and that's obviously so completely fundamental. To understand how energy works and it, all its ramifications, and then with um, the studying the computer, let's have a machine that can that can solve problems and can can do run algorithms and all this and and studying that turns out to be studying information, and then and 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 the more we work with with computers, the more the better we understand how information works. And now the next stage is suddenly as the computers computers are you know work because because of quantum mechanics and as they and quantum mechanics is describing things, r roughly putting it on a very small level. They have impact in a, on a big scale, but as you make the computer smaller and smaller, you're coming up against what has been viewed as problems, like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, where uh, you know we can't know where something is specifically at the same time as knowing exactly how fast it's going. And, and this, these, this is gonna, this, how, how are computers gonna get any smaller if we have to deal with these, and the speed of light is a limitation, and there's one other I'm not thinking of, but all these, it, quantum mechanics seems to ultimately maybe be a limitation to computers, and in fact, what began to be discovered in the 80s, um, two of the, the pioneers of this idea, but there were, there were several that I'm, I'm not going to, uh, mentioned, but Richard Feynman, who's one of the greatest physicists ever, and David Deutsch, who maybe you haven't heard of. He's a, a, a physicist at um, Oxford, though he's not really a, at Oxford because he doesn't really leave his house, and um, he doesn't, he, he sleeps during the day and is awake at night, and, um, and but this turns out to be a good system, and, um, and Feynman and Deutsch separately in the, um, uh, in the early 80s said, no, quantum mechanics is not a limitation for computers. This is gonna be, there's gonna be a, a new era of a, a computer that, that uses the, the, these, what, what we look at as restrictions, it's going to use the magic of quantum mechanics um, to make an amazing computer that, that in some ways will complement the computers that we're using today, and it, it, in some ways it will, it, there are certain applications um, that that it turns out a computer using the what people like to talk about as the magic of of quantum mechanics using these these counterintuitive things can can perform calculations that no Turing machine, no digital computer could ever ever do. And the famous one um, was come up. Uh, Peter Shor at MIT discovered this in 1994 that a quantum computer using, um, sorry, I have to rewind, and that uh, uh, our computers that we have here um, are, are, of course, using bits of information, binary digits, one uh, that's e something that can be a state that's either one or zero. And quantum computers, the whole idea behind quantum computers is instead of bits, instead of just a one or a zero, you've got quantum bits, qubits, and these can be a one, can, can register a one or a zero, or a superposition of on and off simultaneously. And, um, and this is, you know, it's, that seems like a problem. That seems like a bad computer <laughs> if it's saying yes and no at the same time, but what, um, what Deutsch saw, Deutsch instead calls this quantum parallelism and shows that if, you, if you're working with bits, with these qubits that can register two different values simultaneously, then you can, it's, it becomes computing in parallel. If you, if you can work out how to get the answer out at the other end, which is non-trivial, you can, the computer can do all sorts of calculations simultaneously. And what Peter Shore, to get back to the, this big impact that quantum computers could have, in 1994, Peter Shore showed that uh, 
quantum computer would be able to crack all the codes that that our banking security is based on, the internet security is based on, the, the government security is based on, they're all based on um, these public key crypto, crypto systems. And, um, and because the quantum computer can calculate in, in this vast parallel, which, which Deutsch talks about um, calculating in, in multiple parallel universes, um, uh, it, it, can, it can crack all these codes in second, in, you know, just an incredibly short amount of time. And, um, so that so that's on a on a sort of a, a world news kind of level of the impact a quantum computer would have, but on the um, but on the deeper level as well, the, the this is changing our understanding of information and 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 just as um, just as energy in the in the thermo in the seventeen. 1700s. Suddenly, it was a, it was a new new concept, and to to understand that, to, to to make it specific and make it a real quantifiable, studyable thing, and then information in the computer era, and 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 now, it, it with with quantum with quantum computing, based on superposition and entang and using entanglement, which I um f forgot to start with, but um, where, where quantum objects can be correlated when very separate and they, they can, if they um, interact and then separate, if, it seems that if you measure one, it seems as if you're affecting one at a vast distance away. And this is becoming, it went from something in 1935 that Einstein was saying, Quantum theory predicts this, obviously quantum theory is wrong, to being a resource. Entanglement, just like energy and information are resources, and entanglement is, is, going, is going to be a resource, and that a quantifiable resource, and this will change all of computing and information science as well. So. Is, is, is the universe a quantum computer? And this is a favorite... Um, phrase that, that several books by very important uh, quantum information theory guys, the quantum computation guys, discussing the universe, b believing that because of this, this deep intertwinedness between matter, uh, between quantum, between the lesson of quantum physics and information, they, they, they believe that that the universe can be best viewed as a, as a quantum computer, and um, it, there, I, I am not well qualified to judge um, th this. But it, it, uh, the problem I have with this vision is that it always seems at the critical moment there's sort of a sidestep between is is matter are matter and information the, the same thing? It's kind of hard to say, um, but it, so it seems. Like people are saying that the world is built out of information, and and I guess I'm not at the point right now where I understand what that means. And and nor are they. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for all all of us? Uh, well. Um, Your description of entanglement, everything being connected with everything else, as George is doing, uh, describes the brain. And just to give one connection that seems comprehensible to me, and much of what you say is not, uh, if you recognize that the word that we have in medical codes, say, conveys something like 7% of the information that the uh, context conveys about 26%, but the facial expression conveys, and your expressions all over, 50-some uh, percent of the information. So presumably we're going to have iPhones that give pictures of the person's face pretty soon and things of this sort. But uh, you seem to be connecting a great deal of this, and I compliment you on it. 
Thank you. The, the brain is another, I, it, Niels Bohr, one of the great, greatest quantum physicists, um, did really love this analogy of, of the way um, mental processes work with the way uh, quantum physical processes work. And it, it's an analogy, um, and it's not clear how much our brains really are dependent on quantum, I mean, ultimately, it's made out of quantum materials, but th this is still an area where it's um, something that's fun to think about, but uh, not clear what the connection is yet, so it's exciting to... It seems to me that before we get to this rather heavy uh, stage of computing, uh, we'll probably have to have some transitions in what's available to the public. Steve Jobs uh, recently in the Wall Street Journal opined that uh, we are going to probably get away from computers. I'd just like to hear your comments on that. I think uh, Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates, uh, they don't think that so much, but uh, of all people, the Apple folks, uh, at least as Mr. Jobs uh, says, uh, we're going to probably transition more to, uh, well, iPads and maybe some devices that haven't even appeared yet. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is, uh, these are other forms of computers. Um, they just are in different forms, different guises. They have the same computational technology that uh, what we call the, our computers have. And so I, I don't think the change is quite as large as, as the change from where the computation happens from uh, your own box or your own uh, iPod, iPod or, or uh, iPhone or Blackberry or whatever to uh, some supercomputer center across the country. And that supercomputer center means that uh, a, a tiny uh, handheld device can, for example, do the most complex three-dimensional game uh, that can be designed. It can be performed on the, any kind of uh, computational device with a browser uh, as a result of this move to uh, 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 cloud uh, computation. And that seems to me to be a more radical change than Jobs' very, uh, Steve Jobs' very inventive uh, proliferation of new computational uh, devices and forms. Given the analogy that you finished with about uh, matter and information, and I think I would have flunked physics without the curve, so. <laughs> but I think matter uh, either can or does create energy to some degree. Equals mc squared. Okay. So energy equals the mass of an object times the speed of light squared. Okay. So my analogy, given what you finished with, is that information can create energy as well. We spent a morning in here getting information. Uh, most of the information that was got in here this morning is not obtainable to the outside world. So my premise here is that if you withhold matter, in essence, energy, uh, information, you have the ability to withhold energy. You have the ability to hold back people's wills. You have the ability to hold back people's desires to be motivated enough to function. I heard people here this morning come up to the microphone and ask what could I do? What should I do? What should we do? And yet there's maybe, if we're lucky, a hundred people in the room. And you probably know that the school education is inadequate for the most part. And you know that the media information that's being provided is inadequate or propaganda for the most part. So my point, I guess uh, I'm going to leave it in the, in the, uh, in essence, a question is that without information, appropriate information, in this case, as of this morning, scientific information, 
do you have the ability to make the analogy between matter and information stimulating energy? Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a dualist, and I believe that uh, with uh, Norbert Wiener that there is that uh, information and matter are two different things, and they can't be uh, integrated as and uh, reduced to a single thing. And anybody who tries to do this is in the situation that uh, Max Delbruck described as uh, attempting to pull himself out of a swamp uh, by uh, pulling on his own hair. And uh, information and the ideas in our minds are not the same thing as the structure of our brains. I don't know whether, uh, and, uh, and Gödel, um, Kurt Gödel was the, was, the leading mathematician of the 20th century and um, militant dualist. And I think his uh, explanations still hold. And this effort in the, among the contemporary quantum information theorists to say that information and matter are the same thing is, is, uh, is muddled. And uh, they don't, they, they, it doesn't lend clarity to uh, the discussion of either information or matter. I'm Bob Chiak. I'd like uh, Melly's and George's response, uh, keying off Melly's observation that when some of these uh, foreign tribal leaders were given aid and then they distributed it preferentially to members of their own tribe, it led to civil strife. Uh, my observation and what I've learned from Thomas Ole and George and others uh, would lead me to the hypothesis that when any special group is favored or disfavored by any government or power, that leads to civil strife. Uh, and that's the opposite of a government of laws where everyone is subject to the same laws. Your thoughts and reflections, please. Um. Yes, I would definitely agree with that. And I think, again, that um, the, one of the problems with these m large chunks of aid going into these governments that aren't, don't yet have that system of, of checks and balances and stable judiciary systems um, is a real weakness. And, and why that, that does end up happening is that a lot of these countries um, don't have those inherent checks. And because there, there's not a strong um, sort of middle class to hold the government responsible um, uh, for their actions. John? Um, uh, John Philp from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, George Gilder um, mentioned the challenge of orienting aid toward the future. And I had a question for Melly at that juncture that, uh, um, I w really wanted to hear more about Kiva because that seems to be a perfect tool for orienting aid toward the future. And I, I, I just wondered, you know, what are some examples of what entrepreneurship looks like in Burma at the local level, and how how do uh, the people how are they made aware of this opportunity for uh, international investment? How does that how is that presented to them? The second half of the question, I don't know the answer to. I think it's a great question um, of how, how do these entrepreneurs hear about the organization Kiva? And I have only really experienced it from the U.S. side. I haven't, I've never visited one of these sites. But um, uh, some, the, in, and there are, I would, I suspect there are zero Burmese entrepreneurs on it, unfortunately, because the, um, I think that there is a state where there, there are some countries that are so corrupt that it's it's very difficult for any um, any of this kind of uh, businesses to spring up. And a friend of mine who's come and now um, studied economics in the U.S. had started a, a seaweed harvesting um, 
business, and uh, this was a seed that, uh, seaweed that was considered a weed in Burma, but in uh, Korea, I think, was a delicacy, and he started exporting it. And as soon as it was, uh, he went through all this work to convince the, f the fishermen who he was hiring that he really was going to pay them for this. And, um, and then at the end of the day, when the local government officials saw that it was a, a success, they essentially edged him out of business um, by uh, raising um, un unbearable uh, taxes on his yeah. business. So, a similar thing happened with sea urchins in Maine. Oh. <laughs> there, it turns out they're a delicacy to the Japanese. I've eaten them, and they're actually quite delicious. They're like custard, but, uh, <laughs> but that's a perfect example of creating wealth. You realize there's a need for something, and you, it's garbage to you, and it becomes valuable because you're willing to take the effort to package it, present it nicely, say nice things about it, and ship it somewhere. And there's, you've created something. But I mean, what are some of the countries that are involved, I guess? I think that there's a lot of um, sub-Saharan African countries, a lot of um, sort of small, even uh, uh, agricultural enterprises that have a trade component to them. So various nuts, um, uh, food preparation and selling locally, um, even sort of chicken hus husbandry, all kinds of um, small businesses like that, or um, transportation businesses. Those, those are the sort of things I've read about. I think a woman shell selling cashew nuts was one of the featured businesses. Thank you. But Kiva.com or something like that. Um, oh, if you I'll Google Kiva. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just get online. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, for, um, for George and Melly, I, 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 I want to say I'm Neil Milberg from Superior, Colorado. What a family. You're just incredible, and uh, you're, you made uh, your, your. You should see the Robinson family. <laughs> your uh, your comments about uh, about the devastating problems that arise from this top-down uh, giving giving aid to through through the state is so uh, it, it's so endemic in our own society. Look yeah. at what the aid to dependent children oh uh, programs have done to the minority, especially the black communities. It's devastated the community. And uh, this is very, very important, especially in terms of foreign aid. Foreign aid is technically unconstitutional. There is no basis in the Constitution for us giving any aid to any state. Um, and it has a negative effect generally, my opinion at least, mm. according to the free market principles that you will find. You mentioned Hayek, and uh, you know, part of the, he's a student of von Mises, so all of this comes into play. And uh, in, we, I mentioned last year when you spoke about the, uh, the problems with foreign aid to Israel and what it's done and how we've corrupted their system. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's more of a comment than a question, but I really appreciate what your, uh, you know, your, uh, your the presentation. Aid to, the aid to Israel is really a way of, of financing purchases of American military yes. equipment, mm -hmm. often invented in Israel by the Israelis. Yes, okay, I mean. thank you. Quick question. I'm aware of about, oh, I'm not sure exactly how many, about 16 uncertainty principles. Are you exploiting all of them in quantum computing? Um, describe. Well, some involve angular momentum. All right. You, you, you have the normal momentum time and um, position. position, and you have the energy time. And it's, um, it's all, it, it's different versions of the wave particle right. duality. Right. It's different ways to talk about what happens when something that really has wave-like is behaving in wave-like ways, but right. sometimes behaves yeah. in particle. It's, it's, it's a way to talk about this. Um, okay. So there's lots of different yeah. specific permutations. All right, so are you actually integrating spin in this already? Yeah, I mean, it's all just version. It's, it's just the fact that when we get down to these to this level, we can't describe it as particles, and we can't right. describe it as waves. And, and position and momentum and energy and time and various kinds of spin are all things that, that don't really apply to waves. And so when you have objects that, that 
act like particles sometimes, but are, you know, described by waves in other ways, these words we're using fail, and the uncertainty principle, we're, 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 we're talking about attributes that, that, aren't, that don't really describe ultimately what, what's going on. And, and someone like Niels Bohr would say, but our words are all we have, so we've got to, we've got to work with what we have. And somebody like Schrodinger would say, we cannot use these words that are, that are so misleading. And I think that that, um, I mean, both would agree that when we talk about it in terms of math, it all works fine. And so the question is, how do you translate the math into English or German or whatever it might be? And, mm -hmm. and it's a big problem, and the uncertainty principle is, is part of that. And so all these manifestations of it are, are just the same issue popping up in... Okay, <laughs> I thank you. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> and uh, Carver Mead says they're all just Fourier transforms in different <laughs> manifestations. Anyway, I think we're... Louisa's book, by the way, is called The Age of Entanglement, if, and, and it's out in paperback now with a uh, uh, blurb by Francis Ford Coppola, who discovered it and is celebrating it. Oh, I didn't know that. We do have copies of that book, The Age of Entanglement, at the desk, as well as uh, The Israel Test by Mr. Gilder, so if you'd like to buy a copy, please do so, and I'm sure, I haven't asked them, but I'm sure they'd be happy to sign it. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs>